Thank you for joining CareerCert for our webinar today on difficult airway management. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At CareerCert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to best protect and care for those in their communities. We are grateful for this opportunity to connect with you today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Dan Bunker. Dan has worked in the healthcare industry for nearly 30 years. He worked as a registered nurse in the coronary care ICU for seven years and was a nurse, flight nurse with Intermountain's Life Flight for nearly 10 years. He has been a certified registered nurse anesthetist for 11 years, working in the hospital setting as well as maintaining his own private practice. In addition, he is a professor in the nurse anesthesia program at Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah. He has served in various leadership roles within the Utah Association of Nurse Anesthetists and is currently the president-elect. And now, Dan, I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much. Um, a few quick things before we get started. Gosh, it's always awkward having somebody uh, talk about you while you're sitting right there. Um, Danielle did a great job. What you should know, uh, this is it, right? My name is Dan. Um, I've been doing... I've been in healthcare for 30 years. I think along the way, I picked up a few things um, in on the EMS side with Life Flight when I was a flight nurse, and now um, over on the anesthesia side where I've been doing this for quite a while. And I, I believe I have a very unique perspective. I can bring in um, the anesthesia piece and, and bring it over to the EMS piece because I remember what it was like, right? When, I, when we were with Life Flight, we had to get so many intubations every quarter uh, to maintain our airway proficiency, if you want to call it that. Um, so I knew what it was like to go into the OR and, and ask these anesthesia providers, hey, I'm Dan, I'm with iFlight, can I, can I get an intubation today? And how awkward and uncomfortable that could be, especially when that anesthesia provider was not a very nice person. Um, so I have, I have remembered that, and I am always happy to help people increase their skills, because it's my thought, if I have a, a paramedic coming into my OR and they want to, they want to practice some intubations, that, that paramedic could be picking me up or my wife up or my child up the next day, right? They could be ma managing that airway. So why wouldn't I want that person to have the best possible skills they can have? So I will give you whatever I can possibly give you during this hour and a half or however long this takes. If I, if I think of things that I think can be shared. I know we have a lot of EMS here. I think we've got quite a few registered nurses. Um, we've got people from all over the healthcare spectrum. So um, I, I'm gonna try to bring in what I can. I was gonna try to show you, um, I had, the goal was to have my camera up so I could kind of visualize as we went on um, that picture that my that was on my thing here a second ago. My wife picked it. I don't know why. I was telling Danielle that's a bad picture. So anyway, we're going to fix that later on. Um, so I'm going to merge. The goal is to merge what I've learned in in anesthesia because let's let's be obvious here, right? I do this every day. We do like you know we do cases we intubate almost every day, um, two to three days a week. Uh, strictly pediatrics, and then another day or two I'm doing adults, eight to ten cases a day. So I feel as though I have a lot of airway experience that I can that I can help you with. So um, you know, sit back, relax, enjoy the show. Uh, there's going to be an option for you guys. You can type in questions as we go, and there's I've got three different uh, spots along here where you can ask them uh, as you type them in, and I'll, I'll try to get through those as soon as I can, and, and I'll, I'll hit the ones that I think are, are most pertinent. Um, all your questions are important, um, but I'll just try to get the ones that I can, that I can get in. Here's the overview and objectives. We're going to look at some anatomy, um, specifically the vocal cords and, and kind of while we're doing direct, uh, tracheal laryngoscopy and kind of what you're looking for. We're going to talk about some bag valve, um, bag valve mask ventilation, oral and nasal pharyngeal airways, different LMAs. I wasn't quite sure when we say advanced airway what people were looking for, right? So, and, and re remembering what it was like to be um, in the ER and to be on, on the helicopter, to be with life flight, you know, we did, we did airways, we, we intubated. We didn't really use the adjuncts very well. We didn't use those supraglottic airways. I think I maybe did in 11 years, maybe two LMAs. So unless you're in the OR, I don't think you get a lot of experience with them, but they're an integral piece to airway management if things go bad. If you can't get that airway, you can't intubate, you need to have something else, right? So an LMA is a great bridge for that cannot intubate 
Um, you can possibly ventilate, but you need something else to kind of help you along the way, and LMA is a great thing. So we're going to spend some time with LMAs, and I'm going to show you the differences um, because there's quite a few of them now. There's not just that classic that came out years ago. There's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of LMAs in the market. We're going to talk about endotracheal intubation, indications, complications, the procedure itself, uh, maybe some extubation stuff, other equipment and drugs necessary, and uh, confirmation techniques. Something that may you may or may not have heard a lot about is apneic oxygenation. Um, you know, in some arenas, in research and stuff, uh, some some hospitals that have a university attached to it. I think they've probably been doing this a little longer, but apneic oxygenation is a very interesting topic. And if you're not using it, I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage you to jump on board starting today, because if you if you use this this technique. Um, it can buy you some time if you're having difficulty with a patient um, and trying to trying to uh, secure that airway. Um, we'll talk about some video laryngoscopy, and then we're going to quickly cover the difficult al uh, airway algorithm. You may or not may or may not have any experience about. I'll I'll just go through that, um, and we'll kind of kind of show you how that works. So uh, hopefully you can see this little red spinning dot when we did the basic airway. Um, video it wasn't a live webinar it was just something that i recorded and when i read the results afterwards they were positive but a lot of it was hey i wish i knew what he was pointing at because i had no idea where he was so we have found that i actually have this little pointer so let me let me orient into what we've got going on here this is this is as you are doing a direct laryngoscopy um this is not what you would see as far as colors but this is the the, the program that i had it kind of breaks it down so uh, you can you can point things out a little bit better. So if you were if you had a, a laryngoscope in and and you're and you're trying to do a direct laryngoscopy, this is not the color you would see, but these are the structures you would see. And this structure right here is um, your major airway landmark, right? This is your epiglottis, and I should have put that on the exam at the end, your your review questions, because that one really is important. So even though it's not one of the 15 at the end that you have to know that is what you need to know right this epiglottis this big pink floppy structure as you're looking at your airway that is your major airway landmark and that's what you should be looking for when you're doing direct laryngoscopy if you can find that and you can control that you can get this most likely not not every time but most likely you're going to be able to, to get the intubation or you're going to be able to at least know what's going on because this is the piece that if you can find it you know that right behind it is your is your vocal cords, your glottic opening. And, and if you hear me say vocal cords or glottic opening, we're, we're talking basically about the same thing, right? Um, these two structures right here, it's interesting uh, when you're in the OR with somebody and you're teaching them how to intubate and they've got some experience or, or maybe they don't, but they, they've done some training. And I ask them, okay, what are you seeing? Because that's important as the, as the, as the teacher to know what your students are seeing while they're in the airway. And they say, I can see, I can see the arytenoids. Well, that's impressive because um, you, they can only do that if they can see through, if they've got x-ray vision, they can see through structures. So that would be impressive. So I don't think that's happening. I have removed um, some other structures right here so you could see the arytenoids. It's this cartilage that are sitting right there. It's two of the three sets of paired cartilages in the, in the airway. The arytenoids are important because they are the base for the corniculates. The corniculates sit right here on the arytenoid and right here on the arytenoid. And then over here, you've got your right cuneiform and your left cuneiform cartilage. So right here would be your corniculate, right here would be your corniculate, and then to the outside <clears throat> is your cuneiform. And underneath the corniculates, and I'm pointing to right now, those are your arytenoids. So technically, when somebody says, I can see the arytenoid, that's not really true. They can see the corniculates. And that's important because if there's a difficult airway, and they're in whatever uh, blade they're using, they might not be able to get that epiglottis out of the way. And this is all they can see. This might be it, right? So they need to say, I can see the corniculates. And that's important because you know that if we can move this up right here, if we just lift up that epiglottis right here where this little cursor is going, those are your vocal cords. You can see the very bottom of them right there. So knowing the anatomy is very, very important because you don't wanna, and I remember that. I remember that as a flight nurse when I first started. I didn't have really, I mean, I had the classes and we're doing all that stuff to get us ready to go out there. I was clueless when I put that blade in the first time. I just wanted to get the intubation, right? And so I stick the blade in, I'm monkeying around, and finally I'm able to kind of see something. 
but I didn't know the anatomy. I, I, I was not doing it the way that I should have done it. I should have been very familiar with the anatomy. So when I went in there, I would know what I'm looking for. So that's, that's one picture. That's one slide. So here we go. Here we've lifted it up, right? You've got your epiglottis lifted up. And, and later on in this webinar, we'll talk about how that happens or where you can put the, the blade to make that work. This is the view that, that we want for the most part, right? And again, this would all be pink. This would not be white. But these, this is your glottic opening right through here. And most of the time, when you get a good visualization, you would have this white band on that side and white band on that side, and that would be your vocal cords. If you're, these are called your false cords um, in layman's terms, and sometimes those can be swollen and they'll be covering up your, your white bands, your white vocal cords. So that might be all that you see. But this is the view that you're looking for, a nice grade one, and we'll talk about that in a minute, a nice grade one view. And you know that when you go ahead and, and place that ET tube, um, you should be able to get that in. So this is where you get the epiglottis up out of the way, and now you can see your, see your vocal cords. When we talk about, so now let's back up just a, a little bit, and we can kind of review or, or talk about um, the grading system. So the Cormac Lee Hain grading system, this is once you're in, right, and you're, and you're um, lifting that epiglottis out of the way in whatever way that you're doing, you've got basically four grades. And there's, I think, a, um, a modified now or I think it's either grade one or grade two that has a, an A or a B on it. I don't remember which one it is. I apologize. I don't think that's necessarily that important. What, what is kind of nice though is when you're looking at these airways, you can you can document. And that's kind of what this is all about, right? Is is when you document or you're talking to you know your 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 EMS partner, your paramedic partner, or you're in the OR or whatever it might be in the ICU and you and you do your intubation, you can say I had a grade one view versus you're in there looking and you've got a grade three view. Right, grade one view, you can see everything. It's wide open. Your epiglottis is out of the way. You have full glottic opening. You see the vocal cords. Um, grade two view, um, only about half of the vocal cords are, are, are in view. Grade three, you might have a little bit of a glimpse. Grade four, okay, this is the pucker factor view, right? And I, and I hope that's okay that we say that. This, this is the one that scares you because you can't see squat. You can't see um, the epiglottis. You can't see vocal cords. You can't see, look at it. You can't even see... Like over here, you can still see your corniculates and your cuneiform. Over here, you've lost your corniculates and your cuneiform cartilage. Over here on grade four, there's nothing, right? This is just this is just tissue. And these are the ones that scare you. And these are the ones when you get in and you look, you aren't going to mess around. You're going to pull that blade out and you are going to go to to plan B. Okay, what device do you have that's going to give you a better view? Because this is not pretty. And if you continue to mess around, you're just gonna cause tissue damage, which is gonna cause swelling, which is gonna, uh, you're gonna bleed, and it's gonna make your view even worse. For those of you with airway experience, which I'm, I'm sure there's a handful of you in here, if not the majority of you in here that have it, because this is a difficult airway class, um, you know what that's like when maybe you've been the, 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 um, the person to come in and kind of rescue the, the original rescuer, and they've had difficulty, and you get in there, and it is just a mess. Uh, because they've they've wasted too much time and they've done too many attempts, um, it can make it ugly if if you if you have that. So if if you go in and you see this, really you should be going to your next um, your next option. And let's let's talk about that really quick. Um, if if you go into an airway and and you try to do drug visualization and you don't see anything, so then you and maybe your saturations are dropping, so you you back out and maybe you get your bag, bag valve mask out and you you mask them back up. And their stats come back up and then you go in again if you haven't changed something <clears throat> if you haven't changed patient position if you haven't changed your blade if you haven't done something different and you are thinking that you can go in and get it the second time when you haven't fixed whatever it was that was wrong the first time that my friends is the definition of insanity okay you need to do something different because it didn't work the first time is not gonna work the second time so you have to change it so you know, given when you're out in the field and you've got a you've got your trauma patient there on their seat collar, backboard, headbed, right? There's not a lot of changing you can do as far as positioning. Well, then you need to get out a different blade. You need to get out your video scope. You need to do something different because uh, just going in and, and doing it with the same stuff is not going to work. So here's your grading system, so you can kind of report on your on your record and your you know your uh, your partners out in the field what that what that view looked like. Also, it's handy if you go into the ER, you've intubated out there, you had a grade three, and you can tell the the ER staff, what, what that airway was like. That will help them determine whether or not they want to change that tube out or just leave what you've got in there. 
quick review on the bag valve mask. Um, you know, we all know that this device can be used without oxygen, right? You don't have to have an oxygen supply. It's a self-inflating bag, unlike the bags that we have connected to our anesthesia machines in the afternoon. Those need to have a constant flow of oxygen to actually have those inflate. And, you know, there's are certainly pros and cons to that, that anesthesia machine. Um, I don't need to get into the real specifics here, but there's one thing I wanted to pass on with the bag valve mask that you probably already know, but I'm going to pass it on anyway. Remember that you have to have, that bag needs to be, needs to be compressed or flow to be happening through that piece. So here's what I'm talking about. Here's the situation, right? You're, you're out in the field. You're in the you're in the ICU, you're on the floor, or whatever, and you're you're masking your patient because they were apneic or whatever happened. Now they're breathing spontaneously, but and you just want to give a little bit of uh, you know, a little blow by. And I've seen people with the bag valve mask, and they just kind of put that on their face or near their face, and they just leave it there with the oxygen flow going at 15 liters, and that's awesome. But they're not squeezing the bag <clears throat> unless there's a bag out there that is different, which and maybe there is now. But for the most part, these self-inflating bags have a valve that will prevent the oxygen from flowing through it unless it's being compressed. Or the patient, it's a tight seal and they're taking a deep breath and they're able to generate enough negative pressure, that can open the valve. But if it's just on blow by or just sitting loosely on their face where they're not gonna be able to generate that negative pressure because they're, they're able to entrain all this room air and it's not gonna get that nice tight seal, this bag has to be squoze. So you can either you know, slowly squeeze it. And we all know that as you squeeze that bag, at some point you're gonna to have to let go to, to inflate it again, okay? But that's just the, the one piece that I wanted to make sure that we, all, that we all understood is that unless you've got some bag that you specifically know, you've read the insert, you know that it's true, that oxygen will flow through it without compressing it, you need to be squeezing that bag to get oxygen through and just having it on the patient's face and not doing that is not doing them any good. And maybe you've seen it, maybe you've had it on there and the patient's saturations are dropping and everybody's like, well, crap, maybe we need to mask them back up again because they're, they're beginning to desaturate. Well, that's probably not it. It's just probably because they're not getting any more oxygen. And just as a quick review, right? Room air oxygen is about 21%. For every liter flow we give them, we give them 4% more on the FiO2, right? So room air is 20%, you give them one liter, that's gonna bump them up to about 25% because you had 21 plus four is 25. So just, Remember that little thing, you probably already knew that one anyway, but that's, you know, uh, if the patient needs more, you got to give them more and, and just having that on their face is not going to do it. Okay, no, uh, nasal and oral uh, artificial airways, these are two pieces of equipment that can really make a huge difference. Um, I think, and please, you know, take what I'm saying and, and, and listen to what I'm saying, and, and that's all that I'm saying is that our population is getting a little heavier, and I think there are ample studies to prove that. Uh, what goes along with that is when our population gets heavier, it's, it's not just in the abdomen, it's not just in the thighs and the rear, but we're talking about redundant tissue in the airway. So as whatever it is that's causing them to become obtunded or unconscious or having that restricted airway, that tissue um, is going to relax, right? So in, in the airway. So we need to have sometimes something to get it out of the way. So a oral airway or a nasal airway is a great adjunct to make that happen. I mean, I'm telling you, 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 can, you can go from an obstructed airway, completely obstructed, to sliding in an oral airway on a, on a unconscious patient, because we all know that a conscious patient is not going to enjoy an oral airway. A conscious patient or semi-conscious, you know, in and out, if you will, will tolerate a nasal airway, nasal trumpet, whatever you want to call it, much better um, if it's the right size. If it's too long and you've got that way down to that, they're going to gag on that thing. So if it's the right size, which we'll talk about here in a second, a, a awake patient will tolerate that or semi-awake, but um, they will not tolerate an, an oral airway. Remember how to measure these things, right? For the oral airway, you take the, you measure with the device, the, the, the oral airway from the incisors, right? Your front teeth used to be kind of from the corner of the mouth, but the studies are showing that um, the, the better is from the, the middle of the incisors to the tragus of the ear, and the nasal trumpet is from the nair to the tragus of the ear. So you just kind of get, get one of them out, measure it. Is this one too long? Is this one too short? The right piece makes all the difference. If it's too short, it's not going to get it's not going to get that tongue out of the way if it's an oral airway. If it's too long, um, it can cause just as much damage as far as obstruction, can gag them even more. Uh, so you have to have the right one. Now, which one is better? Well, that all depends on your situation. 
um, like when I'm doing some pediatric, we do a lot of pediatric dental general anesthetic stuff. Um, if we've got a bunch of extractions that we've done on like a one or two year old, we pack that mouth full of gauze so they're not bleeding into the airway when we're all done. And after I extubate, I'll slide a nasal trumpet down there, completely bypass the oral pharynx. And now I'm now they're just breathing spontaneously nasally and it works out great. So it just depends on your situation. And, and I'm going to have to apologize and excuse me if I bring in the surgical stuff as I'm talking. Uh, but it is, it is applicable, right? It doesn't matter that, I, that I'm not using trauma situations um, or medical emergencies every time. The, the airway is the airway, in no matter what you're talking about. Um, a bloody airway is a bloody airway, no matter where you are, in the dirt or in the ICU or in the OR. So um, just, just take for what, I, what, what I'm saying. Okay, um, I'm going to see if I can make this work now. Um, I'm going to go over here and see if we have any questions and I'm not seeing any which honestly makes my life a little bit easier oh wait yep okay so off we go we're going to keep going here um next let's talk about laryngeal mask airways uh so back in the day and pardon me but I don't remember what day that was what year uh, the, this, the simple, the classic, the classic laryngeal mask area was invented. And this was invented mostly specifically for the operating room because we had, they had a couple options back then. And I'm going to say back then because I wasn't around. Thank heavens. They could either intubate every patient, no matter how simple the procedure might be, or the provider would have to put the mask on and mask the patient for the entire procedure if they didn't want to intubate. So... I've talked to some folks that have since retired that have been around a very long time, and they said that they would have to sit there and hold that mask for two to three hours sometimes if they thought it was a short case and it went longer and longer and they, and they never intubated. These guys had, and guys and gals, when I say guys, please know that I'm referring to, to both genders, so don't think I'm being sexist. Um, these guys would have some strong hands. Imagine holding that CE technique for two to three hours on your patient. Um, you know, even with the oral or nasal airway, still having to hold that tight so they're so the gas, anesthetic gas is not leaving the room. So somebody got smart and they said, all right, well, if we have a case that they don't need to be intubated, but we don't want to hold that mask for a long time, let's let's invent something. So they invented this um, laryngeal mask airway. Now, some important things about the LMA is well, we have them from from really newborns up until uh you know, any age, and it, it's not age-based, it's weight-based. So to get the appropriate LMA, you need to have the right, the patient's weight, because then that will tell you which one that you need to use. Um, the majority of LMAs, you can only, here's some some of the negative things, you can only administer 20 centimeters of water pressure to generate the, the volume that you need. So if you're, if you're putting the LMA in and you're out in the field, you don't have that num num uh, manometer on there to tell you how much pressure you're generating when you're when you're um, squeezing that bag so just remember that you shouldn't be like going gangbusters on it you know just give a nice slow even breath and that should be enough to get you what you need to do now and, and when this goes in you should be looking for basically all the same things you do when you intubate somebody right when we intubate you know first the first sign is you actually see that et tube go through the vocal cords but then everything else is the same we're looking at end tidal you're looking at chest rise and fall you're listening for breath sounds saturations, uh, misting in the tube, you can still see the LMA's mist. But all the other things that we look for are still there. The only thing that we really, that's different is that you didn't visualize the LMA getting seated. And you can see on this picture that the tip of that LMA kind of gets seated in the esophageal outlet or inlet, excuse me. Um, another side note is, you know, two to three hours is kind of the maximum that we leave these things in. So if, you know, if, if by chance somebody in this program is out there in the middle of nowhere USA and you've got to transport somebody and they can't, it's a long transport, you can't get them out by air or they're not sick enough to be to go by air, they're not awake enough and look, they've got an LMA in, long story short, right? They got an LMA in. You can't really leave that in for two to three, more than two to three hours. It can cause some, some, some nerve damage, potentially some circulatory issues if it, gets, if it gets left in too long, so. And the other beautiful part about the LMA is like, unlike, unlike endotracheal intubation, which, there's a very steep learning curve with that. And, you know, if, if that didn't happen with you, then I am proud of you. Uh, but for most people, you know, to get that, to get really good at intubation and to, you know, 
to be able to get through those difficult ones and the semi-difficult ones and just be able to pretty much intubate anything that comes across you know, uh, their path takes some time. Versus an LMA, where as you can see here, the studies are showing that uh, with an experienced provider, right, 88 to 95% success rate on the first time. Now, don't let that fool you. Um, a, a misplaced LMA is a nightmare. So don't think that like, all right, well, we couldn't intubate, so the LMA is going to be easy. That is not necessarily the case. You can put that LMA in and it's not doing anything for you and you still have to be able to troubleshoot it. Maybe it's positioned wrong, maybe it's not the right size, maybe there's something that's blocking it. So you have to be able to troubleshoot these things also. So they're not, they're, they don't save it, they're not the savior, they're gonna save everything, but they can certainly um, make your life um, a little bit easier if you have not been able to, if, if you can't get that airway. And I know that in, in the field, uh, that this is not your first step, right? I told you at the beginning, that I think while I was a life flight, I think maybe I put two LMAs in, but I honestly think those two LMAs I put in, I think they saved that patient's life. They were very difficult to mask ventilate, very difficult. We couldn't get them intubated um, and just we're like, all right, let's try it. We slid the LMA in and we were able to get them oxygenated and ventilated and uh, get them to the facility. So they, if you don't have some type of super glottic airway, and when I say super glottic, right, the glottic opening, vocal cords, these sit above the cords. It is a, an LMA is a super glottic airway device, and there are other super glottic airway devices out there. I hope that I, I've made that clear, that super glottic is a category, and an LMA is one of those devices that fit into that category. And I have a lot more LMA stuff here, so I hope you're not going to be upset with me because uh, I wanted to make sure that you could get it. There are a whole range now, right? We started with this one right here, this classic LMA. It was not disposable. You'd have to um, put that thing through the autoclave whenever it was used. And, and if you accidentally threw one away, people would get really mad because they were, you know, three, four hundred dollars at the time. Now we've got all these different types. We're going to kind of go through them. I don't want to bore you, but I want to I want you to, to kind of see what the different different ones are, because then maybe it will determine what you want to do, which one you want to have in your ICU, which one you want to have in your in your uh, in your ambulance while you're out there because i really do think that everybody should have access to one it is in the difficult airway algorithm some type of superglottic device so you should kind of be familiar with it so these are the the five that we're going to kind of review uh for a few minutes right now the classic flexible pro seal supreme and fast track and maybe i should have said at the beginning um, i don't have any financial ties to any device that i'm talking about today um i probably should have mentioned that earlier so I just want to kind of share with you some of the things that I've used and what I've seen, what I like, and but I'm not getting you know reimbursed or taken care of in any way from that. So the LMA Classic, this is the first generation. This was the one that came out that um, kind of changed the game, especially in the operating room. Uh, very valuable tool. Now this is the reusable one, and you can usually tell it's reusable because it's that that fleshy colored um, LMA right here. So these are the ones you're not going to want to throw away. So if you're you know by chance helping somebody out, they've got one in, you pull it out, don't uh, chuck it because it's expensive. There are plenty, we have plenty of disposable ones now. And I'll, I'll be honest, if I'm, if I'm in the operating room ha as a patient and I know I'm going to get an LMA, I sure hope they're not putting that one, a reusable one in. It just kind of scares me. With all the options that we have out there today that are, that are disposable, I want them to use one, one and done and, uh, and get rid of it. So I know that I'm using, a, they're putting a sterile one in me, but there are plenty of options. Here's an interesting one, an LMA flexible. As you can see right here, if we go back, right, that one is, it, it, that is stiff, right? It, it looks it, and that's because it is. That plastic uh, or whatever we've got here um, is not very pliable. So you can, that can kink. So remember that when you're in the field, if there's, a, you know, whatever might be going on, if that's in, that can kink. So just be careful as you're, if you know, you've got the LMA in, you've got your bag valve mask at the end of it, and you're and you're you know bagging slash masking that patient whatever you want to say uh, you got to be paying attention because if you're you know looking around and, and you're moving your bag that can either pop off the end uh, at, at a bad angle or it will completely uh, bend that tube. Now this flexible one is a little bit different. You can see uh, that it's got these wires that go along here. This this coil which has made it so this can be a, a much more flexible LMA. So if I'm not sure what conditions out in the field you might be using this for, but if you think that a flexible one would be more of an option for you, you haven't had good success with the, the classic, then this is something that you could look at. <clears throat> the ProSeal LMA is something that I think if I were, 
if I were a control over a, um, a flight team or over EMS, I would suggest that the ProSeal LMA would be the device that I use. And here's the reason. If you look down at the tip of this LMA, you can see that this, and where did this go? This is at the esophageal inlet, right? That's a suctioning port. So this is your airway part right here, right? Your normal connect this part to the bag valve mask. Right here is a suction tube. So if there, you know, there's blood, spit, mucus, you know, thin vomit, you can aspirate out. You can suction that stuff out, which is very, very nice. The other nice thing about the ProSeal LMA is right here, you can generate higher pressures. So as opposed to the 20 centimeters, centimeters of water, centimeters, whatever it is that you want to say, this one you can go up to 10 more. You can go up to 30. So, and there's also a bite block that's incorporated into it. So uh, if the patient is, is waking up a little bit, they can bite down on it. And, and it is possible to bite hard enough on these, just like an endotracheal tube, to bite down if they're, if they're waking up and to kink, to kink that flow, um, which if you've been there, you know how difficult that can be. So a lot of people will put in a, you know, these, these bite blocks. Here's a little trick. And take it or leave it. If you put an LMA in or you put an ET tube in and you're worried about that patient waking up and biting and maybe you don't want to have an oral airway in there, you don't have one, you can't find one, it's whatever. Grab two to three to four, four by fours, roll them up like a cigar and slide that thing down right next to that ET tube or that LMA. If somebody tries to bite through those, it's not going to happen, right? When you roll those together, it makes a pretty solid piece enough so so they cannot generate enough pressure with their with their teeth and their mandible to to bite through so just try that next time and you'll see that actually will and that's a quick fix right and then when you want to take it out you can just take it out you see these bite blocks in the icu that it looks like the you know a, a football piece where you've got you know the they're, they're wearing those um mouth guards and the et tubes coming out the middle of it i mean they look archaic um and very uncomfortable these four by fours rolled up can and make a big difference. Here's the LMA Supreme, very similar to the Pro Seal LMA. It's made with this pre pre made bend in here to facilitate um, uh, to facilitate placement. Uh, these can also be can have higher generating uh, pressures, ventilating pressures when you want to do that. It also has the suction port. Uh, it also has that you can see right here that little hole down there in the tip. So bigger and it has the the bite block also so the biggest difference here is kind of how that is it's got that preformed um, structure just to kind of help with insertion and here's the other one here's here's kind of the the other one that you might want to have um, on your rig with you it just takes it takes a little more experience to make this one work so the fast track lma this this is pretty cool you can intubate through these so you can use it as either just an LMA, so you, can, you know, you're out in the field or wherever and you need to get something, you can't get them intubated normally. You can slide this in and use it, uh, just, you know, put your, put your bag valve mask right there and use it as an LMA and off you go. The other nice thing <clears throat> is that you can intubate through it and there are more pieces that come with this, but you would um, put it in as normal and then there's this little, uh, you put the endotracheal, and these are specific tubes that come with this device. So you just can't grab any any ET tube off the shelf and think it's going to work. You have to have the ET tube that comes with this. You put the ET tube through the LMA right here. And then as that's going through, as it gets to the front and, and, you, and there's markings on it, so you know where it is. Once that tip of the ET tube gets right here, you can elevate with this elevating bar. You can kind of lift back on that and it kind of flips this little tip that's in there. And then there's a stylet that goes on the end. So your ET tube is going through, you put the stylet right here, and then you push the endotracheal tube through with that stylet. It gets in the right place and you're able to back the LMA out over it while you're kind of giving forward pressure. I know I'm doing an extremely poor job of explaining how this works because it's only a single picture without all the pieces. If you're interested in the LMA fast track, I would suggest that you like everything else in life, you can Google it and look at some pictures on, on some videos on how this LMA Fast Track works. But it's a cool device because it gives you the option to do a blind intubation if you if you need it, right? You're you you know you got the LMA in and that's a, a nice little bridge for you. But um, if you've got to get that patient intubated, then then here is a great way to to make that happen. If you can't get it with normal direct uh, tracheal laryngoscopy, so 
it's a it's a great device to use in the cannot intubate cannot ventilate scenario which we all know is worst case when you can't do um, either one of those things and here's just more information on that uh, on that lma fast track um which uh i think i probably covered it on that last slide so sorry i, I was ahead of myself on that one okay i'm gonna i was anticipating we would have some more questions so i'm gonna see okay um one question was is there research information concerning the measurement you mentioned for the oral pharyngeal airway measuring from the central incisor to the tragus yes yes there is i actually that's kind of funny you asked that um another piece that i do for career cert i've written um, a handful of uh, articles on different topics one of them was actually on oral and nasal pharyngeal airways and in my research to make that the most applicable and and i try to when i do these articles i try to get research no older than five years uh, and most of it is about two to three years old um and and that's that's one of the things that i found is that the research is showing that central incisors to tragus of the ear is more um, effective than than side of the mouth, uh, corner of the mouth to the to the tragus. So if you're if you're interested in that, you can I think look at the career cert website. Maybe Danielle can kind of give us some information at the end of where you can go to find that information because on all of my articles, I I have the resources of where I get my information. Um, I'm not just going to go cowboy and, and give my opinion on that stuff. I have I have pulled research to back up what I'm saying. So um, you can take a look at that if you want to and, and get your uh, get your um, resources. The other question is, what is the benefit of using an LMA versus other advanced uh, uh, other advanced airway devices? And that is a great question. Um, the I would say the the biggest benefit of using an LMA versus any other advanced airway device is that it's quick. So let's say that you are um, you're in your ambulance, you're you're uh, either you know on scene still, or maybe you guys are heading to the hospital, and you are trying to secure that airway. You're trying to intubate this patient. You can't get him intubated. Um, you could, and, and it's not working. You can quickly grab an LMA, lube or no lube, and slide that thing in there, and then you can mask ventilate. Now. Are there other airway advanced airway devices that are easy to use? Yeah, of course. And we're going to talk about some of them uh, that can kind of help with uh, visualization of vocal cords if intubation is truly what you uh, what you want to do. Um, but I would say the biggest benefit is that they're for the most part they're very quick to place. Now, I don't think I mentioned it before, and and you guys probably already know this, but that an LMA does not secure right quote unquote secure your airway as far as protect it, right? So it, and and we all know the trauma patients, right? Every trauma patient we've ever picked up for some reason had just left McDonald's. They had just had the Big Mac, large fry, large shake, and Coke. And and so we are always worried that these patients are going to vomit and aspirate. And that is the issue with the LMA is that if they, they it is not going to secure that airway, and if they vomit, they could easily aspirate with that. Versus with an endotracheal tube, right? We have that ET tube in. We've got the cuff inflated, so it is it is quote unquote protecting. The lungs, they can still aspirate, but it's not as easy. But with the LMA, um, it's not it's not securing it. Now with the Pro Seal, you're able to to suction out the tip. But again, if there's a lot of stuff in there, you're gonna have a hard time uh, keeping up. Um, are the LMAs easy to dislodge? Uh, still easy to dislodge when in the field? I would say, you know, yes. You know, there you get them in, and it's kind of funny when you place an LMA, you'll place it, and if it if it's a good if it's a good placement, you almost kind of feel a little bit of a clunk. Right, you're sliding it back, sliding it back, and then boom, it's it's there. You kind of feel it seed. I would tape that sucker down, right? Get it where it's at. It's midline in the mouth. Tape it and and be careful with it because it can dislodge easily. But you know, LMA, um, uh, combi tube, ET tube, right? We're always careful with that airway once we get it in. So I would suggest that um, that we make sure that we are being very careful with that. Um, and the last one, we'll just hit this one. If you have an aggressive ventilator uh, using a, a bag valve mask with an LMA and overpressurized device, do you see the air bypass in the esophagus or out of the mouth? Great question. Um, you will, if you've got somebody that's aggressive, and I like that, an aggressive ventilator, uh, and you're using a bag valve mask, you can, um, it'll go both ways. It's going to go through the path of least resistance. So, 
depending on, on, on how well it's seeded, depending on if it's partially seeded, depending on, on, on right the, the anatomy that's happening, but you still have a pretty good leak or you're really, really squeezing that bag, whichever way is going to be easiest, that volume is going to go. It's going to go to the, to the lowest pressure. So most of the time you'll hear it um, coming out of the mouth, but you're also, you could see that stomach begin to inflate. So you, you do have to be careful. So that's why I said, when you put these in, nice, easy bagging, right? Nice, easy squeezing of that bag. And, and, you know, again, we're all, we're all human and we all get prone to that adrenaline rush. We can't really help it when those adrenals start kicking it out. If we're not watching ourselves, we're going to, we're going to overventilate. So um, yeah, you got to be careful because you can entrain air into the stomach. And then now that Big Mac that you've, the patient had is now going to be joined by a bunch of air, which uh, it's not going to handle it forever. So those are, uh, those are very good, um, very good questions. Okay. Uh, that I believe is the end of our, our LMA section. Um, so I hope that was informative for some of you that maybe have not had a lot of experience with the, with the LMA. Now, when we talk about advanced airway stuff, uh, personally, I think that advanced airway is endotracheal intubation, right? There's other things that we can do. We could talk about, um, we could talk about a retrograde intubation. We could talk about a surgical airway. Um, I mean, there's a myriad of things that we can talk about. And, and some people might not think that endotracheal intubation is advanced airway. It absolutely is. This is not an easy task. If you go into, if you go into direct tracheal laryngoscopy and, and intubation in a cavalier approach, then you're going to hurt or kill somebody. If you've given drugs and you're going to intubate and, and you're going into it without the seriousness that it is and not thinking that it's quote unquote advanced, that's when somebody's going to get hurt. So that's why I wanted to take some time and focus on, on, on intubation. And again, if you're a master intubator and you've done this, for 30 years and you've intubated a gajillion people, I still hope that maybe you sitting here for a few more minutes is going to benefit you in, in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's just a review, um, it's beneficial. For those of us, right, any of us, if we think that we know everything there is about a topic, that's probably the time that we should maybe recheck ourselves or maybe get out of the field because that's when we stop learning and that's a problem. So, as probably a review for endotracheal intubation, right? If we have somebody that's got a Glasgow coma scale of less than, I was always, always taught nine, but nine or 10, right? They're not able to protect their airway. That's the point here. Neurologically, when they have something in the back of their throat, whether it's blood, spit, vomit, whatever, they're not going to be able to control it. You know, you and I, when we have that happen, we cough, we gag, we were able to get that out of the way so we don't aspirate it. They can't. So Glasgow coma score less than about nine or 10, that airway needs to be secured if they're not oxygenating and ventilating. Um, we're, we're trying everything else. We've got a non-rebreather on them. We're trying to mask ventilate. We tried an LMA, right, whatever. And we're, they're not able to, we're not able to oxygenate and ventilate. Then it's time to move on to a more advanced airway and that's gonna be endotracheal intubation. Remember um, oxygenation, right, and ventilation, two separate things. We're talking about how are we gonna deliver that O2 to the body and then how are we going to really, for the most part, um, get rid of that waste product, get rid of that CO2. That's what we're talking about with ventilation, and we need to have both of these things to be successful. Um, if they've got some illness, something critical that they need to get that airway secured, we need to be able to hook them up to a ventilator and drive higher higher pressures, and we're not going to do that with a CPAP or BiPAP, then it's time to intubate. Um, and then if if we're trying to control you know, this, this example of um, to prevent hypercapnia because we don't want the patient to have increased intracranial pressures, we're going to have to do that. And then the last one, which is in my arena all the time now, is surgery. There are plenty of surgeries where they have to be intubated, laparoscopic surgeries and a myriad of others. So those are just some indications. We probably could have made a good, you know, a bunch of slides when it comes to this one. And we're going to do probably more talking than, than visualization of slides with, with this. Um, but the, the procedure itself, uh, most of the time we're going to be doing oral um, intubations. There were a handful of times we're out in the field, you know, a non, non-traumatic because uh, you don't want to put that ET tube through somebody's nose and have them have, um, you know, put that thing into the brain because they've got an injury that has, uh, has you know, caused some injuries back there. And you, we've all probably seen that picture of that, that nasogastric tube that was placed nasally 
um, that coiled around into the in the cranial vault uh, because they had a fracture. So, uh, but we did do a few nasal intubations using um, using some cocaine to numb up the back of the nose, and then a uh, what, would, what would we call it a BAM. I'm not sure what what the BAM stood for, but it was that little teeny red piece we put on the end of the ET tube as the patient and these patients were spontaneously breathing still, and you could slowly slide that back, and with each exhalation, that BAM that little cap on the end of the E-tube would make a high whist high pitch whistling sound. And you were able to just kind of track that in and, and get that right into the, and you knew that you were in the right spot because as it, when it was seated right and placed right, you were still able to hear that, that whistle. But most of the time, I think we are all aware that we're doing these oral intubations. And so, you know, the equipment needed for this, if we just take a few minutes and, and talk about that, right? The, the first two things are gonna be your, your blade and your handle. Um, and a blade and a handle that works. Uh, I remember when we were on Life Flight, right? Every shift we went out and we checked all the equipment from from um, aft to whatever. I forgot the other name. Anyway, we opened up every bag. We made we checked expiration dates. We checked fluids. We checked uh, our ET our, our intubation intubation equipment. Put every blade on. Made sure the the, the lights worked. I mean, if, if if any of you have ever been in a situation where you need to intubate emergently and you put the blade on and you turn and you click it into place and you have nothing, right? No joy. That is a sinking feeling. So always make sure that you're ready to go. And there's so many different types of uh, laryngoscope handles and blades now. I use a rechargeable one now that has kind of a, a very bright blade on the end or bright light on the end. It's not a bulb. Um, I've kind of gotten away from the, I haven't used a bulb blade in a very long time. They burn out, they're not as bright. So I would encourage you to maybe look at some other devices if you're still using bulbs because these other ones are very, very bright. Um, and then we got to look at the blade that you want to use, a Macintosh versus a Miller. Um, I, sh I should have thrown a few more slides in here and I apologize. A Macintosh blade is that curved blade and the Miller blade is the straight blade. The differences between those two, and I could probably, I could, if we wanted, roll back into the slideshow and if you'll just maybe mentally do that, back to the pictures at the very beginning where we had the epiglottis. So so picture that, oh my gosh, let's just do it. Um, that was probably slide number, let's see, let's guess. Ha, huh. okay. So we've got, our, we've got our view of the airway. Right here, and to get rid of this, this is just for whatever the, the program puts that in there. This space right here is the vollecula, and it's not going to be this, this pronounced when we're actually looking in where you're not going to see all this stuff. But right above the epiglottis is the, the vollecula, and that's where we put a Macintosh blade, the curved blade. You put that in there, and then you lift at kind of a 45-degree angle away from the patient. So up towards, let's say if you're sitting in the room, up towards the corner of the room at that, the far wall, where the far wall meets the ceiling. That's where you're. That's where you're elevating. You are not cranking back. Let's just review this a little bit, right? We never crank back. When you crank back and use that, you, the teeth as a fulcrum. That's when you've added some teeth into the airway. So we never, ever, ever crank back. So as you put the blade, the, the Macintosh blade, the curved blade in the vollecula and lift the cranium, that's when the epiglottis flips up, and you're able to see the vocal cords. Now the difference between the Macintosh, which is what that blade was, and the Miller, the Miller blade is a straight blade. We actually lift the epiglottis up out of the way with the Miller blade. So you slide it in nice and easy, get the epiglottis uh, with the tip of that blade, and then we lift in that same way, and then you man manually pick up that epiglottis. Now, which blade you use is kind of your preference, right? The Macintosh blade is a, is a wider blade. Um, Miller blade is a thinner blade. There's pros and cons to both, and uh, you know, there are, our, our healthcare field is a different thing, right? It's a different animal. People like think that what they do is the very best. And if anybody else does it in another way, they're not smart. So please don't be one of those providers. I hear people say all the time in, in the anesthesia world, if you use, the only blade to use is a Miller blade. And if you're not using it, then you're not a very good provider. Give me a break. It's whatever gets the job done safely, whatever you're good at. I had an intensivist who was one of our control physicians at Life Flight. When, and when he was on, on call in the hospital, you know, he'd be one of the guys to respond to, to codes and intubations. He carried with him a number four 
Macintosh blade. Now for most adult patients, a number three is going to be just fine. He carried a number four, which you've never seen a number four. Next time you're in the hospital or next time if you can get your hands on one, look at a number four Macintosh blade. It is huge. It looks like a hockey stick. He would use that as either a Macintosh, so putting it in the valection lifting, or he would use it as a Miller. It was so big, he could actually still lift the epiglottis like a Miller blade could, but he was doing it with a Macintosh blade, and he liked it because he said it was the best of both worlds. So that was kind of a little trick that he liked to use. So whatever blade you, you like, um, you know, get good at it. But here's my other, here's my other um, advice. Get good with both of them. Go back and forth. You know, one day you're using Mac, one day you're using Miller, or one week you're doing one or the other. Get good at it because, like we said at the beginning, if you're intubating and you can't get it and you go back in again with the same exact thing and thinking you're going to get a different result, then you're wrong. Go back in with a different blade uh, and you'll find that you're, you might be able to see what it is that you that you need to see. Oh, gosh, I'm way off there. Okay. Um, that's just, so that's some of the two pieces of the most important equipment is the, is the handle and the blade. You, you, you may need a stylet. And again, I, I hear some anesthesia providers say that you shouldn't ever intubate with a stylet. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to have an anterior airway. And what I, what I mean by anterior airway is that if you are, you're looking to intubate your patient, right? You're in there and it's kind of like that one slide where you couldn't see very much. All you could see was the corniculates. Or the and the cuneiforms, maybe it was a grade two or grade three on that Cormac view, right? You just couldn't see very much. If you have a stylet in there, all the way to the tip of that ET tube, and you've got that bent up just a little bit, that could be enough for you to be able to swing underneath that epiglottis and get the ET tube where it needs to be. Whereas if you don't have that stylet, you might not have that angle of approach that you need to be able to get. And that is why the anatomy is so important. Right? If you know the anatomy, you know that you've got the epiglottis, maybe you can see the corniculates, you know that if you can go up underneath the epiglottis and angle that tube up, that you're going to be able to most likely be able to get that in the vocal cords. Now, the danger is that if you go if you go below that, right? what's below that? That's the opening to the esophagus. We don't want to put it in the goose. right? Putting it in the goose is not going to do your patient any good. So we need to be able to get that thing angled up. You want that interior. So when I say a patient has an anterior airway, that just means that everything is shifted. You know, if they're laying down, anterior is up. So their vocal cords, everything seem to be a lot higher. Um, so anterior airways are notoriously more difficult airways because you can't see from where we're standing outside the body. Even if you align everything, you can't get the view that you want to be able to get. So a, a stylet can make a huge difference when it comes to something like that. Make sure that you have a wide variety of ET tubes. You know, for in, in generalities, a man can handle a seven and a half and most women can take a six and a half or a seven. But that might not be the case. They could have some type of subglottic stenosis. Something could be in there that's keeping tight. Um, the, whatever trauma event, traumatic event that they've just gone through out in the field might be making, so you have to have a smaller tube. So make sure that you have tubes that fit and make sure that for the most part, I think, I can't think of any EMS situation where you wouldn't have a cuffed tube because that's the benefit of, of having them intubated. Or one of the benefits is that you can, you can secure that airway. You can intubate, inflate the cuff, and now if they have blood or spit or vomit in the airway, you know, you can, you can suction that all out, hopefully before it slips past that cuff. And that takes me to the next thing, and that's um, having some lube, some KY jelly or something on there. Another one of the or up at the school, um, when we're talking, you know, airway, airway, airway up there, one of the articles that I read one time talked about that um, if you put KY on the, around the cuff and around that distal part of the tube, but, but specifically the cuff, it's not just to ease, to make placement a little bit easier, because I don't know if anybody's ever tried to intubate somebody and they're a really dry oral pharynx and they get that in there and it just kind of, you know, if it touches the, the tissue at all, it just kind of sticks makes it a little more difficult. So if you, if you lube that up a little, it makes it much more easier. The other benefit, and even more so, was that it has, it prevents micro aspiration. So if you, let, you know, envision the trachea, and envision an inflated cuff, there is still gonna be some little ridges in there because that cuff usually sits in the package for who knows how many years, deflated, and then you inflate it, it's not going to be completely inflated. It might look it, but there's still going to be some ridges in there. So if the patient does aspirate, 
um, because of those ridges that are in it, they might have a problem. Whereas if we put KY on that around that cuff, um, it, it decreases the micro aspirate that can happen. So I'm going to suggest that we that you put that on there because it can make a big difference. And then a syringe of some type to inflate that cuff. You know, it's just the simple things, right? But in in an emergency situation, if you're not if you haven't practiced, if you don't have all the stuff right there, you might miss it. You might intubate, get the tube secured, you got the entitle up, or you know, you get the tube secured, you squeeze the bag and, and you're hearing all this air, you're not getting good entitled, like what in the crap's going on? Well, you forgot to inflate the cuff, right? So make sure you've got a syringe to be able to be able to do that. And and first, and I'm gonna say first and foremost, but you know, one of the most important things on top of all this stuff is you have some type of end title monitoring. Right, that is going to be what confirms that you are in the right place. As a review, when we intubate, first thing is you're able to see the ET tube go through the vocal cords. Um, that's number one. So then, after that happens, you know, you're holding on to that tube, you hook it up to whatever it is you're going to be ventilating, oxygenating with. You, you're squeezing that bag. You know, and then a lot of things will happen at the same time. Right, all of this stuff happens at the same time. You see misting, you see chest rise, if you've got something listening for breath sounds, all that stuff happens all at the same time. Um, and tidal notoriously takes two or three breaths, especially if you're using that colometric one that you stick on the top and it changes to yellow or purple. It's been so long since I've used one of those, I don't even know because every everything we've ever done now for a very long time, even out in the field, we were using some type of um, a readout, either a, a visual with a number or actually looking at the waveform, which is very important. You can you can diagnose a handful of things with with just your entitled waveform. But you have to have you really have to have that to guarantee that you're you're in the right spot. You know, sat probe on, your saturations are coming up. You know, all those things are how we use to to confirm it. Um, complications can be can be wide, right? We can uh, get it in the stomach which is not going to do any good. You can main stem them, which is very common, especially if somebody that's brand new. They see the vocal cords, they get the ET tube, ET tube, and they put that in and they go all the way to their right their, their right main stem. And they're over in that right upper lobe. Okay, That needs to back out a little bit. So we need to train our folks that once you get, once you're visualizing, and, and that's the other thing is that we visualize until as we are pulling that handle out, right? I want you to be visualizing the entire time. You you get your view, you put your endotracheal tube in, you watch that cuff go past the cords, and that's kind of your telltale sign is once that cuff is past the cords, then you can hold that ET tube very tight and slowly will draw your blade. Inflate your cuff, hook it up to the bag valve mask, and then do your thing, right? So you, you just you, you've got to kind of go through those, you got to go through those steps. Um, you know, drugs, I, I skipped drugs. I'm sorry about that one. Um, one of the drugs that is, uh, that I think has changed healthcare. And I don't, I don't think that I am being, um, I'm not exaggerating that either. Propofol or Dipravan or whatever it is that you guys want to, want to call it or whatever it is that you're using. Um, that has changed the game because it is a rapid acting drug without a lot of side effects. Now, the effects that it does have are, are effects that we want, right? We want that, we want to induce them. It's an induction agent and they're going to stop breathing. And those are all kinds of things you're looking for, uh, unless we want to maintain spontaneous respirations and we give a little bit less. And it's a clean drug. There's not a lot of side effects. Some of these other drugs that we've used over time, there's just, there's kind of nasty, right? They've, they, they take a long time to work. Or they take a long time to, to wear off. Like, for example, if you're doing, for those of you that have gone in and had a colonoscopy or, or some type of endoscopy in the last, you know, years, you have probably been given propofol, especially if you've been able to talk to the physician a few minutes later and you're not groggy and you don't, you know, you still remember everything up to three days ago, right? Before we were given a boatload of Versed and fentanyl for these colonoscopies. And people wouldn't remember a week ago. So propofol is just a really clean drug. So if you're able to have that in your in your arsenal, I hope that you can when you're when you're able to do intubations. I know some places that are not allowed to have a whole lot of drug. Um, some type of a narcotic to blunt intubation is always nice. You're not increasing intracranial pressure. So a, a one that's out there that is used quite a bit is, is fentanyl. 
Again, it's a very clean drug uh, that is used. It doesn't stick around for a very long time. It works quick and wears off quick. So it's, it's a good drug for intubation. Um, I also know that there are a lot of um, agencies as far as paralytics go, right? Are you or aren't you allowed to use succinylcholine, which is usually the drug where you use for rapid sequence intubation, which we're gonna talk about rapid sequence versus non-rapid sequence here in a second. Um, are you allowed to do that or are you not? So you just kind of have to, and my, my thing is whatever drugs you're using, you need to know those drugs backwards and forwards, indications, contraindications, mechanism of action, dosage, pediatric versus adult, right? You should have those things dialed in because that's your job. And those are things that you're supposed to be doing. And you don't want to give that drug to somebody that maybe, maybe shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be getting it. Uh, before we talk about apneic oxygenation, let me just back up and, uh, and talk about one more thing really quick. Most of the time out in the field, you're going to be in rapid, rapid sequence intubations, which is just, you know, you're, you give the drugs and then you intubate. And then there's non-rapid sequence where we give the drugs other than usually maybe a paralytic. You mask them a couple times to make sure you can actually ventilate and oxygenate, and then you give the paralytic. So that's the difference between RSI and a non-RSI is that the rapid sequence is drugs are, all the drugs are given and then you just follow it with intubation versus a non-rapid sequence where you give most of them and then um, make sure you can actually move some air and then once you're confident in that, you can intubate. And the reason for that is because I go down the road of, of paralyzing this patient now because if I do that and I can't oxygenate or ventilate, what are my next steps going to be? So you have to be kind of be careful. So anyway, just a side note on that. All right, apneic oxygenation. And I'm not going to I'm not going to read these uh, read the slide to you. I'm just going to kind of talk to you about it. So this is a technique that you can use if you have a patient that you are worried about them going apneic on you during intubation. And here's the technique. You take a nasal cannula, put it on them as normal, and you turn that thing up to 15 liters per minute. Okay, you turn that thing up. Now we all know that any oxygen flow in normal conditions to a nasal cannula, we stop at six. But this time we are pre-oxygenating. Our goal is to fill up that um, airway. So the higher concentration is going to diffuse down into, from the upper airways and it's going to get down into the lower airways. So we want to just infuse as much as we possibly can. So nasal cannula on 15 liters per minute. Then we have the face mask on them. And you can help them out that way if you want. So then you're kind of assisting uh, if they're still breathing on their own. You need that's the whole goal here um, at first. Um, but then the 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 nice thing is when they go apneic, when you've given your drugs to intubate, or they got they are still even without you ventilating them. The theory is the the higher concentration is going to diffuse down, and they are still going to be able to oxygenate. And there are studies that prove this is true. This you know, I should do an article on, on this topic at some point um, because it's fascinating. It is a very cool thing. And there are there are studies out there and case studies that are showing how well this works. Um, it will buy you time, right? In the, in the ambulance, in the ICU, in the OR, pre-oxygenating and denitrogenating your patient is what can buy you seconds, if not minutes. Um, and, and being able to do this by being able to pre-oxygenate your patient will buy you that time. Now, the other side of this, which you're not getting, so this is apneic, right? They are, they're not breathing and they're still maintaining their saturations for a while. It's not going to last, you know, forever. But the other side of that is the ventilation side. This does nothing for ventilation. So that means, right, their CO2 is continuing to climb while they're apneic. And we all know that there are bad things that happen with the high CO2 levels are becoming more acidotic and our body's only going to you know, be able to do so much and bad things happen, it'll become too acidotic. So it doesn't take care of that side of the house. All this is doing is giving you a bridge. It's giving you some extra time to secure that airway and then you can get them oxygenated manually uh, with whatever device you're using and getting them ventilated. There is a study out there that when I was in anesthesia school that we looked at and it took, um, it was on a, on a military, uh, in a military hospital, and they grabbed a bunch of healthy um, folks that were there, you know, and they, and they had a, a criteria for who they wanted. They wanted very, very 
um, fit people, not muscular per se, but just like they had good aerobic tolerance. They were they were exercisers, right? They had them come in and they art line monitors, all the good stuff. Uh, they they hyper oxygenated and then they gave them drug. They gave them um, they sedated them so they wouldn't be you know aware underneath the paralytic, right? Because that would be awful to have somebody give you a paralytic IV without putting you to sleep first. And then you're awake, but you can't move. That's called awareness, by the way, and nobody wants that. Um, they would sedate them and then paralyze them. And they would watch basically two things, their oxygen saturation and their CO2 level via the art line. They were just doing continuous you know, blood gases. And what they found is, and they wanted to see how long this could go, right? How long could these healthy individuals go main, and have their saturation stay up to a certain point to keep them above 90 or 95 or whatever it might be? They had to they had to stop the the experiment not based on O2 saturations, but they had to do it based on high CO2 levels and their pH, because their CO2 was climbing so high that it was driving down their pH so low that it was going to cause some damage that way. But their saturation still still stayed up. So my point behind this is right we, we've got we've got two things we have to worry about here. This apneic oxygenation is cool. And it's going to give you some some extra time. You've got an obese patient or somebody who else is in a high risk group for quick desaturations. So it's going to cover that, but it's not going to cover your CO2. So you need to remember that and make sure that uh, you know this isn't going on forever. Even though their SATs are fine, their CO2 might not be. Uh, okay, um, video laryngoscopy. This is a device, and and I can say this without any hesitation. Both of these devices, I think, um, and I, I can't see the future, of course, or or what could have happened, but I personally think that both of these devices have saved patients' lives that I've taken care of. Um, the the hospital had a glide scope, had two or three glide scopes in the in the OR that we were at. Um, now let's just talk video laryngoscopy for a second, so I can kind of explain to you why I think they saved lives. When we're doing a, a direct tracheal laryngoscopy and visualization, right? Where Where is our head? You know, we're outside the body looking down. Hopefully, we've been able to align the oral pharyngeal and the nasal pharyngeal uh, accesses, right? So we can get the best look that we can. Um, but we can only we can only do so much. We can only see so much because we have that direct line of sight. The beauty behind video laryngoscopy is that the camera is on the tip of the device. So the camera for your glide scope is sitting right there. Your camera for your McGrath, which is what this one, this one right here in the middle, this one to the side, is sitting right there. So let's let's think about that, right? That's where you're gonna be, you're having that device all the way in the airway, making that turn, um, giving you that, that visualization that you might not be able to get standing outside the body, especially for the interior airway. I have done um, I have done laryngoscopies where I have put the normal uh, blade in and looked and and have not even been able to see corniculate cartilage, right? Kind of go back to those other slides that we saw. Like it was a grade four view, could not see anything, way anterior airway. So I immediately grabbed the glidescope of the McGrath, put that in. And if you look up here towards the top of the screen, right, this is what this is what they're seeing now. And and with this one, even with the McGrath, it's still pretty anterior. It's still way up here. Here's your epiglottis right here, this piece, right? Here's your corniculate cartilage right there. There's your cuneiform out to the side right there. At least it looks like to me. And here's your vocal cords. Now, not that not that typical beautiful wide open bands, right? White bands on each side. And right down here, where it looks like that tube potentially could be going, is the esophagus, which is not where you want to put it. All right, we want to be up here. So that's the kind of view that it gives you. And that's why it has saved lives, in my opinion, uh, it's my patients' lives. Because I have not been able to get that airway, you know, in an emergency situation. This is what's made it so I've been able to, to see it. Now, there are there are some drawbacks to these, right? Like the, the glide scope, right? It's on a usually on a on a cart you got to make sure you've got it you got to bring it in there um the mcgrath is very portable these are disposable blades that go on it now the the biggest thing with these is price but i have made it a priority to wherever i work that i would have one of these devices so i i cover two 
facilities where I'm the primary provider and I have bought a McGrath for each facility. And then you have to have, and the blades, you have different blade sizes, right? Two, three, four, there might even be a one for, for small patients. So, but it's one of those things where a video laryngoscopy can really change the game for you. And, and there are some providers that don't even do direct laryngoscopies anymore. They only use video laryngoscopy because their, their thought is, why would I, why would I do something that's less, um, I don't want to say the word efficient, but I've got a greater chance of getting the airway every time when I use the when I use a video laryngoscope. So why would I just always do that? And my my point is, I don't want to lose that skill. What happens if if their video laryngoscopy unit breaks and they haven't done a normal direct tracheal laryngoscopy for years, right? It's it's gonna it could potentially hobble them. And that's what this does, in my opinion. I, it, these are once you get it. Once you know how to use these and you get the kind of nuances of it, intubation really becomes, uh, I don't want to use the word simple, but it becomes simpler. Um, and I don't want to make this so simple that when it becomes difficult, I've lost the skills that I need or I lose the device or the device breaks. Right here on the, on the McGrath, this is how many minutes you have left and then you need to replace the battery. And I'm going to be honest, the batteries aren't cheap. These devices aren't cheap. Most of the time, they're like 3000 bucks for one of these things, and, the, and a box of blades is $500. So they're not giving them away, but what's what's a patient's life worth, in my opinion? So anyway, I'm, I, again, I'm not getting anything from these guys. I'm just telling you what I've used in the past and what works, and there are tons of them. There are so many devices out there now, not just video laryngoscopy, but there's a ton of other stuff that you could use uh, to give you that advanced airway, and that's what this is for, is to kind of go beyond intubation or not beyond intubation, but to give you that beyond direct tracheal endoscopy um, to enable you to be able to get that that intubation. And like I said here, this is I think it's the most advanced, the most significant advancement in airway, um, uh, securing an airway in a very very long time. You've got the camera. The other nice thing about these is that you can people can see what you're seeing. It's not just you. So. If you're teaching, you can have your student around you or students around you and you can talk about the structures. If you are allowing your student or somebody that's training to intubate, you can have them in there and you can see exactly what it is that they're, what they're looking at. Sometimes as a, and, and you know, I, I want, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, I was, when I would go in with LifeLight and get some of those intubations and you had some anesthesia providers that weren't very nice. I mean, I get it, right? We're, we're in charge of that patient's overall well being. I don't want somebody coming in here that could potentially hurt them. So I can see why they were reticent on letting people come in and, and, and help out. This device changes that because now I can see exactly what they're seeing. So I can, and I'll be honest, I, I quiz them, right? The first, if they're going to come in with me, they better know what they're doing. So I will quiz them on structures and, and what they're seeing and what they need to do. And, and that way it helps them and it helps me be able to help them. Because again, if they're going to pick me up off the road the next day, I want them to know what it is they're looking at when they've got this, when they've got that blade down the back of my throat. Um, it's just a, it's a great way to, to visualize this. And I think I've hit all these points um, uh, just in kind of my talking. So if you don't have, and I wish we would have had one of these with LifeLight when I was with them. I think we should have had this in the bag. This would have changed a, a ton of stuff. And at the same time, we could have taught as we were doing it. We could have had the EMTs as you know that want to become paramedics or the paramedics that haven't done a lot of invasions, we could have had them up kind of up at the head and we could have taught them as we were helping them out. And I think it would have been a real great way to kind of bond with some of these providers that are out there. All right, um, there's a spot for questions here in just a second. I just want to show you guys um, uh, this difficult airway algorithm. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists years ago came up with this algorithm to kind of help providers, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing, um, an intubation, you know, it, it's gone south. What do I do now? And this kind of gives people a uh, a path, you know, just like any algorithm of what they should do next. Now, people need to be familiar with this algorithm long before they use it, just like any other algorithm, because in the, in the midst of an emergency, the last thing anybody can do, right? And this is the studies prove this time after time, is follow an arrow and understand what that arrow was asking you to, or telling you to do. So you kind of have to be very familiar with it and you're using it just as a reference. So this is the top of it, kind of tells you what it's for. This is <clears throat> the majority of the, of the difficult airway algorithm. 
And it says general anesthesia, right? This is, you know, it's the American Society of Anesthesiologists. So yeah, this is made for the operating room. But it is totally applicable out in the field if you guys are having difficulties out there. So you can see, right, initial intubation attempt successful. So let's say you're on the field, you've given your patient drugs to, to intubate, it was successful, done, you're finished, off you go. But let's say you're unsuccessful, right? Now what do you do, right? This is call for help, return to spontaneous ventilations and, and wake your patient up. Now, where you're at, out in, the, out in the field or in the ICU, you know, we're not intubating because, you know, we're having a good time, right? In the OR, we're doing it. And most of the time, these are cases that can be delayed or pushed back unless it's an emergency. So that's why we have on returning to spontaneous ventilation and wake them up. With you guys, you don't really have that option, so you can kind of skip it. So we're like, all right, what do we do now? Uh, is your face mask ventilation adequate or is it not adequate? If it's not adequate, consider a supraglottic airway, right? And what did I tell you supraglottic airway was? That's an LMA. So your supraglottic airway is now adequate, and now you can come over here to the non-emergency pathway and go down that route. But if your supraglottic airway is not effective or it's not feasible, that's going to put you down the emergency pathway you know, you're not able to ventilate, you can't intubate, and then you move down to maybe some potential um, invasive airway accesses, which is going to be a surgical airway, a retrograde wire. Um, you, you know, when I say surgical, we're talking about like a cricothyroidotomy, something like that. So this this is what the, the difficult airway algorithm kind of gets you. And uh, it, it's just a nice way to have some backup, right? When the crap's sitting in the fan, not really sure where to go or what you should be doing, the ASA has come up with this this uh, algorithm to kind of help us be able to, to make that happen and this is the bottom of it with just some other things that you saw you saw all this right here on that last slide okay um let's see if i can find us some some questions uh, the one question that i have and this is a, this is a good one do you recommend using a bougie for all or most intubation so a bougie, that, that's a great question. For those of you that don't know what a bougie is, a bougie is like a long, um, a long stylet with a little bit of a curvature on the end. And the bougie is kind of nice because if you, uh, you're you doing your laryngoscopy and let's say that you, you can just see cartilage, you can put that bougie in with that little bent tip at the end and you can slide that in. And the, the benefit of the bougie is that you can use it for two things, right? One, you're, you're able to feel tracheal rings as you move that bougie back and forth in the trachea, you kind of feel it bump up against rings as you're in there. And then that can be used as a stylet. So you can put your ET tube over the top of that bougie and then run that down as it's like a guide wire, if you will. And then you can just follow it in. Since your bougie is in the trachea, it'll just slide right in and then you can pull that, that bougie out. So that's what a bougie is. Now, do I recommend using it for all or most? I would say, I, I haven't used it in years. Um, it is one of those things that I have access to. It's on my cart, uh, but I haven't used it for years and probably because I've got video laryngoscopy. That is the, that is the go-to for me. If I visualize, I'm not gonna waste time by grabbing a bougie and then seeing if I can maybe get it up into the airway and maybe feel those rings. I'm grabbing that video laryngoscope and I'm gonna have a view. Um, though I've never, and I'm knocking on wood here because I've got to go to work tomorrow. I've never had a, a view that I have not been able to get or without, with that, um, video, I've always been able to see what I wanted to see. Sometimes it's been at the very top of the screen. So an extremely anterior airway, but I have always been able to get a view using a video, um, uh, in the operating room. So I'm again, budgets are tight. I know they are, but if you guys can put that in your in your uh, line item as a line item, I would do it because it's going to make your life a whole lot easier on some of those trauma patients. Um, I don't have any other questions. I don't see anything else on here. Uh, it has been a, an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you guys this morning. Um, I apologize, my camera didn't work. It would have been a little more. Uh, we all know that when you can see somebody present, it always works or feels a little more a little more intimate. So I apologize for that. Hopefully next time if I do this again, I can get that taken care of. Um, I appreciate you being here. <clears throat> this is a very important topic, and I hope that you're able to uh, take something from it and and put it into your practice, whatever that might whatever that might be. And and I hope uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dan, for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As Dan mentioned, we have a lot of free resources on our sites to help you improve patient outcomes. So please visit careershark.com to see free articles, webinars, videos, and other resources to keep you at your best. Again, thank you everyone for attending with us today. We really enjoyed this opportunity to be able to speak to you about difficult airway management. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to our team at any time. We appreciate so much all you do to keep our communities safer places. Take care.